We now turn to the final part of habit and virtue. Looking at Aristotle's claim that education and goodness is best undertaken by the state, and this addresses the question of who is to be the moral educator. It also addresses the question of how this process is to be done. Now, Aristotle gives three main arguments as to why the state should be the moral educator. The first one is this, the education of the youth. He notes that acquiring proper training for goodness from an early age is hard, unless, of course, he claims, one has been brought up under the right laws. And his reasoning for this essentially is that the youth, in general, don't find the moral life, the temperate and hardy life, pleasant, most especially because they're young. So as he sees it, you know, roughly put, the kids just want to have fun. They don't want to live like this difficult moral life. And in generally, people who are not young don't want to do so either. So because of this, this lack of desire to live such a life, upbringing and occupations, as he sees it, should be regulated by the law. And his reasoning is, is that they'll be no longer annoying, or in his term, irksome, when they become habitual. So his view is essentially that since people really don't want to live these moral lifestyles, especially when they're young, what has to be done is they have to be trained from the youth, regulated by law, because once they become habituated in this, they'll find it less annoying. Now, in terms of you know, whether this is plausible or not, one way to consider is to look at our own education system. How does it work? Well, basically like this. You know, we go off to you know, kindergarten, you know, first grade, and we first thing we learn to do is line up for bells. And then we go to classrooms and sit in a comfortable chairs with a comfortable desk in rows, listening to someone tell us what we should do. And then we move on to classes where we do work that we probably aren't interested in to turn into someone, and then we keep repeating it. You know, standing in line, sitting in rows, working on someone else's schedule, bringing work home. And of course, what this trains us to do is go on to do it you know, later on. You know, we do it through elementary school, through middle school, through high school, and then go on, for some of us, go on to college and do the same thing, sitting in still uncomfortable chairs, uh, in rows, following no longer bells, but following someone else's schedule, doing work that perhaps we're interested in. And all this so we can have a job where we probably go someplace, sit in a comfortable chair, work hours doing work for someone else in the hopes of getting paid. And so even though we never really enjoy this, we are conditioned to accept it. So Aristotle seems to have gotten it right. That's how it works pretty well. You get people when they're young, condition them, and they find it, perhaps they don't enjoy it, but they find it acceptable. His second argument is the regulation of life. He notes it's not enough to have someone brought up the right way when they're young because they could backslide. And so they have to keep observing that regimen, that schedule, and keep being accustomed to it, even after they're grown up. And so, as he sees it, we don't escape this regulation when we grow up. We need laws to regulate these activities through all of life. Now, why do we need this? Well, what he claims is this. Most people are far, far more likely to submit to compulsion and punishment than to reason and fine ideals. And so as new is we need these laws to regulate us because we're not going to be won over by good reasons and by fine ideals. Now he does note that some people think the legislators, the lawmakers of the, the state, should encourage people to goodness and appeal to their finer feelings in their hopes that they'll respond to this. But it's also thought that these legislatures need to inflict chastisement and penalties on those who disobey through deficiency of character. And he also claims that those who are incorrigible, those who do not mend their ways, should be deported, exiled. Now he does note that a good person whose life is related to a fine ideal will listen to reason. So as soon as you can reach some people through reason, but in general, most people are not going to be, you know, good, at least initially. And so the bad person, whose object is pleasure, must be controlled by pain, like a beast of burden. And these pains must be most contrary to the favored pleasures. 
So to recap the second argument, the gist is basically this. It's not enough to be brought up the proper way. It's a good backslide. And so we need laws to regulate all our lives. Why? Well, because we're not going to mostly be inclined to listen to reason. We have to be compelled. And as he sees it, most people seem to be, you know, bad. And they have to be controlled by, you know, pain, like beasts. Now, the third argument he gives kind of combines the others. It's the argument of guidance. And he notes, once again, that to be good, you have to be brought up the right way, trained to the right habits. So that's, you know, from the first argument, the proper, you know, upbringing. And, of course, a person must spend the rest of their life in what he calls reputable occupations, doing no wrong, either with or against one's will. So his view is basically the whole life has to be covered. The youth, the rest of life, and one must be, you know, kept so one is not straying off into badness. How can this be done? Well, he says what you need is a system of guidance, which has intelligence and force. So it's got to have two requirements. It's got to have this, you know, smarts and also the power. Why? Well, what he notes is this. The orders given by an individual have really no forceful or compulsive power in general. Unless, of course, the person is, as he notes, a king. So if somebody, you know, to take a, you know, a, a modern example, if people are speeding and someone's, you know, standing on the sidewalk yelling at them, slow down, slow down, well, that's not going to have much of an effect on them because the person doesn't have any, you know, compulsive power to, to stop them. But the law does. And so the law has the power to do this. So he sees the law as being essential to this process of moral education. Why? Well, first, he regards it having wisdom and intelligence, presumably, you know, good laws. And the state does have the power of compulsion. To use, to hear back the example of someone, you know, standing on the sidewalk yelling to people to slow down, obviously, you know, people aren't going to listen to that for the most part. But if a police officer, who has the backing of the state, and of course a gun, tells people to slow down and pulls them over, uh, they generally listen to that, because a police officer is backed by the compulsive power of the state. Now, he also notes, interestingly and boringly enough, that although people resent it when their impulses are opposed by other people, even if the people are right to tell them to, like, for example, slow down when they're driving too fast, he claims that the law causes no irritation by enjoining decent behavior. Now, he's probably kind of wrong about this, because I would, you know, infer that people are probably annoyed being told you know, not to do things, or told to do things. But it does seem likely that people are you know, less annoyed by the law than being compelled by individuals. I mean, to go with the example of the, you know, the police, if someone, you know, suppose you're driving with someone, and they just keep, you know, bugging you and nagging you to slow down. Like, slow down, you're going a mile with speed, slow down, slow down, slow down. And of course, that'd be pretty annoying. Now, when the police, if the police happen to pull you over, that's probably not too enjoyable, but the idea that there are, you know, signs regulating our speed limit, we find that supposedly less annoying. So I guess the idea is that we find individuals more annoying than the state, supposedly. So to recap three arguments, the first one is essentially that we need laws to compel us when we're young, because we don't want to live that lifestyle. And if we're caught while we're young, we'll become habituated and we'll accept it you know, throughout our lives. But just to make sure we don't, you know, backslide, his second argument is that we have to be regulated throughout all of life, because we're generally not swayed by argumentation and fine ideals, we have to be compelled by force. And the third argument in sort of combines them all. What we need is a system of wit that's wise and intelligent and has compulsive power. And he regards the state as having potentially, you know, wisdom through good laws, and of course a state can have compulsive power through the police and the military. Now, what if it, circumstances are such that the state cannot or chooses not to do this? Well, in that case, he believes the moral education can be provided by parents and others. But what is needed, since a person, you know, in order to teach something must know about it, a person would need knowledge of ethics to do this. But he believes the best solution is a proper system of public supervision. In other words, having the state do it. But if the state cannot, then individuals, you know, uh, parents can help their children, and friends, etc., can help each other on the way to goodness. 
But of course, this is a, a thing that is not for everyone because someone must know ethics in order to teach people and habituate them in ethics. He draws an analogy, he rather likes analogies, than the case of, say, medicine. If one is going to apply, you know, medicine effectively or heal people or treat people, a person has to know medicine. Or to use another analogy that Aristotle doesn't use, if someone's going to teach, say, geometry, then they kind of get to know geometry. So if the state is failing in this duty, then the individuals can step in, provide the education, but they've got to know what they're doing. So that brings us to the end of Aristotle's look at habit and virtue.